Let me introduce our next speaker, Rob Brown, who is the PR specialist and an author. Uh, he's also the founder of the digital communication agency called Rule 5. And he will talk ab about digital communication and present his idea that digital communications are dead. Please welcome Rob on stage. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, the, reason, the reason I decided to um, uh, make the argument that digital communications are dead is because uh, I've just been involved in uh, editing a book uh, called Share This Too. It was published by Wiley la last week. Um, as Kaseni said, I'm a PR person. Um, uh, I've worked all my life in PR, but, but, but PR has, uh, has had social media written through it for, for a number of years now. Uh, and it's impossible to practice PR unless you understand uh, the uh, dynamics of the social space. Uh, and th the book is quite interesting in that this, you probably guessed from the title, it's the second in a series, uh, the first book being called Share This. Uh, and it came about because there were a panel of us that were brought together to try and modernize the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, which is uh, a representative body in the UK for PR practitioners. Uh, and we decided we we're going to publish some, some a series of uh, papers online. And somebody said, well, why don't we put them together and turn them into an e-book? And somebody said, well, why don't we uh, pull them together and, and go to a publisher and, and, and get it published? So a number of people thought that was a slightly odd thing for people who were operating in a digital space to do. But actually, it was a very successful, uh, it was a very successful book. Uh, it sold several thousand copies. Uh, tens of thousands have been illegally downloaded. Uh, if you'd like to illegally download this, you're more than welcome, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I'm sure as far as the other people are, are, are concerned. Um, I, wrote the, um, I wrote the first chapter of the, uh, 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 of the book, um, which was called Digital PR is Dead. Uh, and I thought maybe that was a little bit too niche uh, for this evening. So, uh, um, so uh, I expanded it into the broader area uh, of communications. I want to tell you that one of the other chapter editors is a guy called Robin Wilson, who is social media director at McCann Erickson, a very big advertising agency. Uh, and I was traveling on the train from him. He's, uh, he's also on the panel. Uh, and I told him that the title of my chapter was Digital PR Was Dead. And he said, uh, that's not a chapter. That's just a tweet. Uh, uh, I, I, it's, not a very, uh, it's not a very big argument. And, and, and when I explained to him what I'm going to explain to you now, he still wasn't persuaded that it, it should fill an entire chapter. So uh, in order to add some things, I'm, I'm going to pull a few other lessons from uh, can you all hear me, by the way? I just realized I suddenly the volume went up there slightly. I thought maybe I was... Uh, um, uh, so, uh, so I'm going to pull a couple of other lessons from the, uh, from the book as well. Um, social media is new. Uh, now, I know a number of you are probably thinking, actually, social media isn't at all new. Social media has been around for a while. But I'm talking in, in the kind of broadest uh, context. So compared with tablets of stones, social media is very new. Uh, it isn't universal. Not everybody uses social media. Actually, it only uh, in the UK only passed the 50% adoption mark uh, about 18 months ago. Um, understanding uh, social media and the dynamics of it requires a certain degree uh, of expertise, uh, and, uh, and digital communications is a specialism. I think all of that's wrong. Um, there are fewer newspapers now. Uh, circulation figures are in decline. News breaks through social channels. Uh, consumers talk back. And uh, television isn't on television anymore, or isn't just on television anymore. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the way uh, we consume uh, all of our content has changed, has changed radically. Uh, and um, just have to look at that image. Uh, how many people watched that live here? Uh, how many people didn't watch it at all? Okay, so fairly small percentage. 15% of the audience, between 10 and 15% didn't watch it at all. Um, but, but it was quite a landmark in, in terms of uh, a, a live broadcast um, uh, uh, piece of content taking place largely without the benefit of uh, traditional broadcasters. Um, another, um, another concept that I've noticed um, recently is um, 
subtitles are getting larger. Um, does anyone, did anyone here watch Borgen, the uh, Danish TV series? That's one, one person nodding there, so, so that's two of us at least watched Borgen. One of the things that was interesting about Borgen, which is a, a Nordic Noir series about the Danish parliament, uh, was that uh, certainly in the UK at least, but I suspect pretty much everywhere, uh, if, you, uh, if you watch the second series, you would have noticed that the subtitles uh, are much uh, larger. Uh, this wasn't real, by the way. Prime Minister, tell us why the subtitles are so much bigger in the second series. Um, can, anyone venture, can anyone venture a guess and is prepared to shout loud enough as to why that is? So people stop watching it on big screens. They're watching it on much smaller screens. So they're watching it on phones and iPads, and, and therefore subtitles have to be larger to be read. So uh, the, the, uh, the standard box set, uh, and, and, and we'll see this becoming the norm, the subtitles, if you watch it on a big screen, are going to take up a, a larger proportion of the, uh, a larger proportion of the, um, uh, a larger proportion of the screen. And so my argument about digital communications being dead, I mean, clearly the, um, the, you know, the title of the first chapter, the title of the conference is a little bit of link bait, not massively successful link bait, in the, uh, given, given that it's a nine o'clock slot and the size, the size of the audience. But actually, my argument is that um, di digital communications is dead, um, uh, partly because it's, uh, because it's mainstream. Uh, it became mainstream uh, when uh, the, the, the um, uh, Facebook uh, passed the 50% mark in several countries uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2011, 2012. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, uh, the uh, Daily Telegraph made a, a major, uh, quite conservative newspaper in the uh, UK. Uh, on the same day that it published this article saying that Facebook was now used by uh, half the UK population, uh, also showed quite how mainstream it had gone by uh, arguing that it was uh, responsible for syphilis. I'm not quite sure how they made that argument, but... Um, uh, but yeah, evidence, if ever there was, that, that, uh, that it's a mass interest medium. Uh, so if it's new and mainstream, if it's new and mainstream, how can it be dead? Well, I don't think it's new. Uh, and, and, and actually, nor does, uh, nor does this guy. Uh, this is a guy called uh, Tom Standage. Uh, he's a journalist and an author. He's an Oxford graduate. He's a science and technology writer for The Guardian. Uh, He's also, he's also been business editor at The Economist uh, and is regularly published in Wired, Daily Telegraph. Don't think he was responsible for either of those articles, uh, but also the, uh, uh, the New York Times. Uh, and he's the author of five books, including The Victorian Internet. And he makes, uh, he makes uh, this argument about uh, the impact of the telegraph on communications. Um, the speed at which information reached audiences used to be dependent on transport. So it was how fast could a vehicle go. Uh, and therefore, the telegraph led to a compression both of time and space. Um, so this reduced the impact and importance of geographic borders um, because they were a barrier in many cases to the passage of information. There was speculation at the time that the, uh, that the telegraph would lead to the downfall of the printed press. Uh, so that uh, once, once uh, information could be transmitted electronically, no one would read it in print anymore. Uh, and uh, newspapers and telegraph companies formed alliances that allowed reporters to send breaking stories back to the office. Businesses began to seek ways to capitalize on these changes and the instantaneous, or what they saw as the instantaneous flow of information. Uh, prior to the telegraph businesses had almost exclusively conducted uh, their transactions on a local level, so uh, with other businesses and individuals locally. Um, information from foreign, associate, foreign associates might only have been received once or twice a month. Uh, but with the introduction of the telegraph, uh, these interactions um, uh, greatly increased. And with this came uh, concerns about an overload of information. So if they were to remain successful, uh, merchants in this time had to adopt the telegraph uh, as a way to channel information and conduct their business. That all sounds quite familiar, really, doesn't it? Uh, uh, in fact, nigh on identical to the impact of, uh, uh, of, the, of the web on communications and business. 
So my argument that digital communications is dead is based on the fact that if digital is just an evolution and all communications are now digital, there's little point in using the word. Um, digital communications really is just communications. So when, for example, uh, newspapers decided that they needed an online edition, and we talked about the online version, now we might as well be talking about the print version of the online title. They're all, they're all uh, absolutely interwoven. So, um, so that, was, uh, that was my opening chapter for the, uh, for the book. Um, I'm going to give you two or three other um, slightly, shorter, uh, slightly shorter lessons from, uh, 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 fr from the book. Um, chapter seven was called um, The Unsocial Web. Uh, it's by a guy called Dr. Mark Pack, who has, uh, has advised the, uh, the Liberal Democrats for many years. Uh, on their, uh, their use of, uh, of social media and online. Uh, he's also a practitioner himself. Uh, I think he's probably got a PhD because I don't think he's a medical doctor. Um, and uh, his chapter was largely about um, the, uh, the sort of negative stuff that goes online. So um, uh, uh, the uh, interactions between people that, are, that aren't social, that are unsociable, uh, negative commentary, how to deal with negative commentary, whether you're an organization or a brand. Um, and, and one of the arguments that he made, uh, which I thought was, was quite interesting uh, and, uh, and, and worth considering, uh, was he said that actually the, um, the argument, the, the uh, um, Monica, that you shouldn't feed trolls is wrong. Uh, and, uh, and that actually... Um, uh, yeah, whilst it's whilst it's common wisdom, it isn't it isn't either sensible or or best practice. Um, and his argument goes that basically, uh, often, and you can you can tr you can translate this sort of argument back to back to philosophy and and things like Wittgenstein's language games and and, and the idea that when when people fall out uh, and when people disagree, it's largely due due to misunderstanding. So so initially. Uh, whatever prompts disagreement uh, uh, is, is, is not um, that, that people fundamentally uh, don't agree or have, have opposing views, it's that they fundamentally misunderstand each other. Uh, and so his argument is that trolling can actually start off as being based in a real, a real genuine grievance. So uh, something where people have, maybe it might be misplaced, uh, but have a, a genuine reason to be upset about something. And if you don't engage with people, uh, then you can't persuade them. Uh, and, uh, and that actually polite engagement uh, and uh, an initial interest in what people might say uh, may, in fact, redeem the situation that's led to the trolling in the first place. Uh, he does, however, say only do it once. So if it doesn't work first time, uh, then stick to the old moniker of, of not feeding the trolls. Um, I was listening to the previous uh, speaker, and I think a number of you might have been here for him, and he was talking about, about um, big data. Uh, in the public, public relations industry, um, uh, big data is, is uh, a particularly interesting way of, uh, of, of or, or is having a particularly interesting effect on how uh, certain organizations communicate. Um, big data does all sorts of things uh, to uh, communications because it does all sorts of things to search and, and, and therefore it potentially can be an incredibly powerful tool. And in fact, um, a lot of uh, the interesting content that organizations are producing that engage people uh, comes from uh, linking uh, information that uh, comes from one set of data with another. And so Simon Collister uh, has written a chapter on the PR power of big data, but he's also identified uh, why big data has a number of limitations. A bit my, like my digital communications is deadline. Um, and, and, and they're all quite interesting ones. One of them, again, and it's, it's not dissimilar from the fact that, that people fall out through misunderstanding. People use language differently. And I don't mean people use different languages, because those barriers are ultimately uh, easy to overcome. But people talking the same language use language differently. Uh, and we can see that in various different types of industry. There are words and jargon that mean something within that industry that means something completely different in another industry. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, it, 
it becomes very, very difficult for technology as it stands to be able to process uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that difference in, in, in nuance uh, uh, th that, that um, comes from identical, uh, identical text references. Um, language also evolves at an incredible rate. And one of the things that, um, uh, that, I, that I, I think I noticed for the first time about, about five years ago was people started, ans started answering questions with the word so. So if anyone asked anyone a question, and particularly at places like this, they would begin with the answer so. It's absolutely virtually universal now. Uh, people do it in everyday conversation. That change has happened phenomenally quickly. It's a very small language change. Um, but, but, but it's very difficult for us to see those things that we're, we're, we're so, uh, so embroiled in and that are part of our everyday li our, our lives. Um, and machines don't get that. Uh, and, and actually, so therefore, uh, they will always be behind uh, um, uh, changes in language. Another challenge for big data is it's also not a uniform and distinct com concept. So it means different things to different people and in different organizations. Another challenge with big data, the idea of big data, and I find this a phenomenal statistic, is that 90% of the data that's currently available has been collected in the last two years. Uh, and so therefore, the historical context for data uh, isn't, is, isn't, uh, isn't yet established. Uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, this sounds a little bit flippant, um, but sometimes big data can be too big. Uh, and uh, I've got a favorite quote from, uh, from Mitch Kapoor, who uh, was one of the pioneers in the digital space, uh, working for, for Lotus and uh, Mozilla and, and, and Second Life. Uh, and he said, uh, he, he said, getting information from the web is like a, taking a drink from a fire hydrant. There is so much of it, it's coming out so fast uh, that it's virtually impossible uh, uh, to do with any coherence. And actually, uh, in, in my life, and I suspect in many others, Actually, what we tend to process is not big data, but small data. Uh, when, when in the public relations profession, we were trying to analyze what people were saying online uh, about our clients, about organizations that we represented, we started off three or four years ago by trying to get it all, by trying to get all of that information. So uh, there were providers that came, came up with uh, tools and applications that allowed us to collect all of that stuff, uh, even from places that weren't uh, uh, that weren't immediately searchable using search engines, and and the, and they were all doing deals with, uh, you know, uh, g doing deals with Twitter and getting the Twitter firehose and, and 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 scraping data from all sorts of places. And we were desperate for all of it. Now we almost never use all of it. We use it anecdotally, so we use it in small chunks. And the sort of anal analytics that are embedded in social media now actually give us much more useful uh, information. Uh, than the, the than uh, 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 than the um, th than the stuff that's coming out of the fire hydrant, um, and uh, the final lesson, which means I'm going to inevitably finish a little bit early, but as it's the nine o'clock slot, you might not mind too much. Um, the uh, uh, the final uh, lesson is uh, um, from chapter thirty one, and uh, it's entitled "The Quantified Self" by Drew Bemvy. I'm, I'm genuinely interested. Is, that, is anyone um, wearing any, any data gathering, wearable data gathering kit, sort of like Fitbit or Nike Fuel Band? Or has anyone got? Am I the only one? Am I the, I, I, um, this is a, a Fitbit Flex. Um, is anyone? Are you, are you all familiar with Fitbit? Anyone not familiar with Fitbit or or um, uh, the? Um, um, I, I think this is going to be, you know, in, ter in terms of in terms of how people interact with each other and uh, and and the kind of uh, next big thing. Ever ever since I started talking about um, social media, people were always asking me, "Well, what's the next big thing?" You know, because because there was a sense that sort of second life came along and went, and then uh, yeah, and, and and Bebo came and went, and and uh, and then Twitter and Facebook arrived and, and what have you. So there was always going to be a next big thing, and there hasn't been a next big thing in quite the same sense for a number of years. Um, but I think the next big thing will be, uh, w will be quantified personal data. Um, 
And so that's all sorts of things. So uh, uh, Nike, are, Nike are in the market and have been uh, for quite a long time now with uh, the Nike Plus system, uh, Nike Fuel Band more recently. Uh, you've got Fitbit, who, who I think are absolutely far and away, uh, currently the best in this area. Uh, and uh, you, you've, got new, you've got numerous other uh, providers. Uh, Jawbone, who I initially knew as somebody that made quite good portable speakers, uh, are now in this market as well. Uh, and, and what these, what, what these um, wearable things do is they, uh, uh, they capture your body activity. So uh, you know, what are you doing? How far are you walking or running during the course of the day? Uh, some of them will monitor your sleep. So they will uh, uh, track how often you wake during the course of an evening, how long you wake for. Uh, there are apps that do that as well. So you can get apps for your phone that will, uh, uh, that will you stick your phone under your pillow and they'll monitor your, your sleep uh, as well. Uh, there are ways of uh, tracking uh, weight and calories, so uh, I inputting uh, what you eat, but measuring that against what you do. There are even ways of, uh, uh, of capturing your mood, your cognitive function, uh, and, uh, and your productivity. Uh, and I, and, and uh, there's, uh, there's an example of all the different places that you can, uh, you can wear this, uh, 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 this wearable data. Uh, and I think this is going to become a, an increasing uh, part of uh, many people's lives. One of the um, uh, and one of the things that fa that's fascinating is how you can start linking these things together. So um, I've uh, I've been concerned um, uh, about my weight for uh, well, probably all my adult life, uh, and uh, but I, I find it very difficult to be consistent about um, things like exercise and, and 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 reducing my food intake. And so I've gone through these exercises a number of times where I've kind of gone, well, I'll weigh myself every day and I'll put that into a spreadsheet and I'll compare that over time and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look at what I'm doing and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make an estimate of how many calories I'm burning and eating a day. And I do that for a few weeks and I get very, very bored of it. Um, with, with, with this device, I also uh, bought a set of scales, not much more expensive than, uh, than, than uh, fairly accurate scales you, you buy without. Um, the ability to communicate and what those scales do is that they're also done by Fitbit. In fact, I think they're probably, they might not be the ones on the, on the right at the bottom there, but they're similar. Um, and they, they basically, they're Wi-Fi enabled, so I get on the scales. The scales know it's me rather than my wife because I'm several stone heavier than my wife. So the scales tell me that it's me and then they send my, uh, they, they send my data to uh, via Wi-Fi. Uh, to, to my account my account with Fitbit, and so it's then on my phone, and I can track that every day, uh, and it does it automatically, so I'm not entering it into a spreadsheet. So I'm only, f I'm only a few weeks into this, but I suspect that I will carry on doing this uh, um, until, <laughs> until I discover that I'm still not losing weight. Um, but, but I think the, the, the fascination with this is that, is that, it, that, that it does have the ability uh, to, uh, to have an impact on, uh, on, on our lives. Um, it can bring very real, genuine health benefits, I believe. Uh, and certainly, um, Drew, who wrote this chapter in the agency that he worked, uh, they all used uh, uh, wearable data monitors over a period. And uh, he said that actually quite a number of the people who worked for the agency actually over a, over a, num a number of months showed very real uh, health benefits, increases in fitness, loss of weight, and so on. Um, they can improve productivity, not just in the sense of work productivity, but productivity you know, gen gen generally on a daily basis. Once you start monitoring what you're doing, you start to do it in different ways and you start to do it better. Um, they're not social networks, but they can be socialized. And actually, I think one of the, one of the most interesting things about, uh, is about them is, is, is you, can, you could either choose a group of people, and again, with, with Fitbit, you, could, you can invite people to your network and you can compare what you're doing on a daily basis, how many calories you're burning on a daily basis through exercise with, with, with close friends or, or, or colleagues and so on. Or you can go to wider groups and just see how you perform generally, say, against your age group. Uh, and that's uh, with Nike Plus, that's one of the, uh, 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 one of the things that's done automatically. Um, the only thing I'd, I'd leave you with on this, uh, on this and, and, and Drew poses the question in the chapter as well, uh, is, is who ultimately owns the information? Because uh, I think it's my information. If it's about my body and what I'm doing, I think it belongs to me. Uh, but I got my first Nike Plus uh, widget, which, uh, which, which uh, basically measures my running, and I, despite appearances, 
I, I run reasonably regularly, so usually once a week. Uh, and I've been doing that for about seven years. And I have seven years worth of data uh, that sits with Nike Plus. And I, I like to compare how I performed recently with how I performed three or four years ago. And I'd like to try and uh, arrest the decline in, in, in uh, uh, my, my, my running pace uh, over the years. And, and, uh, and, and that helps me do it. Um, but I really don't like Nike as a brand. Uh, I, I, and, I, and I actually don't like their gadgets because their gadgets always break and they're very expensive compared with other people. But I stick with them because they've got all my data. So I can't get this, at the moment, I can't get this data from them. So I stick with a brand that I don't like uh, because, uh, because actually part of the brand and part of what makes me want to use the Nike Plus system uh, is, the, is the fact that the information uh, is all there. So, um, so uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, the book's called Share This Too. Uh, if you're interested, it is available uh, as a Kindle version and a hardback copy on Amazon. Uh, but as I said at the start, if you can find it online and you want to download it for nothing, please do that as well. So thanks very much. Thank you. Would you like to ask any questions while we have Rob with us? Thank you. Um, just a quick question regarding to um, Samsung Watch, which is on the news today. Uh, the price point is, I think it's 299 US dollars. Yeah. I start on sale at the end of September. Yeah. And one day is on, the pundit has been panned already. Yeah. Saying it's not feasible, it's, um, interface not that great. Do you have any view about that? Along with the Sony Watch as well. I, d I don't really, because I don't, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about the product. I, d I do. What I do know is that actually it takes a long time uh, for people to get these things right. Uh, and uh, I think, like with uh, with with most technology and most applications, the people that specialise are the people that do it best. So uh, people who are maybe in sort of general electronics or do, or, or or produce. Um, you know, a number are unlikely to be the people who produce the best products. Um, I, I, I've been aware of the Fitbit uh, products for a while, uh, only started using one very, very recently. I've been completely blown away with the functionality. I mean, really, really, really good. And as far as I know, they don't do anything else. And I think that's why. Um, uh, whereas I think, uh, you know, Nike do lots of other things. And whilst they've been very, very clever uh, uh, and, and innovative, they just don't do them as well. So I had a Nike fuel band for three or four months. I liked it, uh, uh, but it broke. <laughs> so, uh, so I stopped using it. And, and, and I think <coughs> you know, Nike are in lots of, uh, lots of areas and lots of sectors, and so are Samsung. And I th my, my, my guess is in, in, in certainly, certainly for, the next, for the next couple of years, uh, w w if we want to get quantified data, we should get it from somebody that that's what they focus on and that's what they specialize in. Was there somebody else? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, about the um, digital communication that are that I'm living in China for five years, and I don't know if you know something about if there are difference of how the people consume and generate uh, communication and content. Because every time I come to Europe, I'm feeling like I'm feeling apart from how the people right now use the internet here and how I am using in China. So th when you talk about the digital communication, did you talk or about the communication? Did you talk only about Europe, or did you see this difference? Or? Well, well I, I do know a bit about China, and I was, I was asked to write, a, a, a public, a, write for a, a Chinese publication a, a couple of years ago, so I did some research then. I suspect you know considerably more about it than I do, but... Um, uh, I mean, one of the things I'm aware of is ob obviously the, you know, the, the importance of mobile phones in comparison, you know, in, in, you know, in China, uh, as, as in lots of parts of the world. You know, people are, uh, are completely leapfrogging, you know, the, the having a kind of desktop or laptop computer and going straight to, straight to, to smartphones as, as, a, as, a, as a way of communication digitally. But my, my argument is a little bit based around the fact that, that I, when, I when I first 
realized the importance of digital communications to what I do every day. So I, I started working in PR uh, at a time where uh, if you wanted to send a photograph to a newspaper, you literally had to, ha had to get the f f photographer to take the film to a lab. A courier brought the film to you. You looked through the transparency, selected the pictures you want. The courier went back to the lab. You came back with the prints, and then you mailed them out to all the journalists. Now, w when I, when I in, in a, in a oh, God, I, don't know, I don't know when it was, a long time ago, uh, at least more than 20 years ago, uh, reali sort of realized that actually we would be able to uh, send photographs digitally. I, I remember talking to a bunch of students about it, actually, in, 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 probably around about, around about 1990. Maybe 1990? 1980, I'm not sure. Um, uh, no, it must have been 1990, because uh, I'm not that old. Um, that, that, um, you know, that we would be able to send photos as attachments, they were, they, they were, they were kind of staggered. My, my argument is really not... I mean, obviously, I don't, <laughs> I don't think we're going to stop using digital communications. My argument is that I think there is no line anymore. So people who talk about conventional communications or mainstream or... So they talk about mainstream media. You hear lots of people talking about mainstream. I don't know what mainstream media is because actually everything's digital. So if you're not talking about mainstream, why do you talk about digital? It's just media. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I, kinda, I don't really like the term social media either. I kind of hope that will go away. Uh, and we'll, we'll just talk about, it'll just all be media. But, uh, and actually, we'll, 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 make the def we'll make the distinctions, not between what's digital or what's analog, or what's the, whether the heritage is di digital or analog, but about w what, what its function is. What does it do? Because that's much more useful than trying to continue to draw a meaningless distinction. So it's just I don't like the word digital. Or social. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Or anything you would like to share? Yeah? Um, when you're talking about um, feeding the trolls, um, so uh, I, I don't know how it is uh, in the UK, but at least in the US, uh, Yelp is, is pretty important. Like, you know, if you're going out to eat, you always look at the Yelp reviews, and, and restaurants are kind of forced to, you know, they may not have a website, but then they'll they'll look at their Yelp and, yeah. you know, uh, try to respond to that. Um, so, um, you know, th that is kind of a difference between digital, you know, media and, you know, before there was no place where customers could, you know, they, they couldn't like just spray paint on the walls of the yeah. restaurant or something. Um, so what are your, your thoughts as a PR professional on, on um, that? Uh, I'm, I'm going to caveat it by saying that that was Mark Pack's argument rather than mine. So, uh, but I thought it was an interesting one. Uh, I don't know whether I agree with it or not. Uh, uh, I, I, d I do think I do think we, the, the the evolution of how people comment through Yelp or through TripAdvisor and all those sorts of things is quite an interesting one because um, I mean it wasn't it wasn't. It was about a couple of years ago. I was in a meeting with a, a hotel company that we were doing some work with. And we talked about TripAdvisor generally. And the hotel, the guy, the guy running the hotel company said, oh, no, that's OK. I know how to sort. I've got guys that sort out TripAdvisor. You know? And I, I think that's got sort of quite disturbing, really, in a, in a way. Um, I, think, I think it's equally disturbing where uh, people use these channels uh, for personal grudges and grievances rather than genuine ob observations. My hope and belief is that... Uh, is that, is that we, reach, we, we will always reach an equilibrium where we all know if we're reading stuff that, it, that is fake. You know, we pretty much all know. So, so if, it's a f if it's a fake positive review or a fake criticism, we pretty much know. Uh, and, and so therefore we tune it out and we ignore it. Um, I know that's not universally true, but I, but I hope it's mostly true. And I hope that over time, that that's, that's, that stuff will gradually get tuned out because people will see how pointless it is. So that's what I'd like to think. Um, but where do you draw the line between what's fake and what's not on the internet? Um, or in uh, or in I think it's about I think it's about instinct. I think it's all about I think it's about instinct actually. I think you know I think we I think we're very g I think you know. I think human beings are very, very good at discerning, w you know, what's 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 true and what's not true. Now, I, I know there are there are always exceptions, and there's some very kind of famous exceptions. And you know, I know for a while that you know, um, 
people thought it was very funny to announce the death of celebrities on Twitter and, and, you know, and, and, and occasionally you know, that would get some traction and what have you. Um, uh, yeah, I think that went away quite quickly. It came and went quite quickly. So, so I, don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I think, but I think we're all pretty good at, 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 at seeing. Yeah, I, 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 I'm pretty sure I know when I go on and I read a fake review about a hotel. I kind of go, it's not, that, that's been written by the hotel manager. Or his sister, you know, or he's, yeah, or yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I think um, we, I think, yeah, I, what do you think? I'm just meaning to say that um, the whole thing about what's fake and what's real is just, it's also beyond the internet, isn't it? Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. It's not just about, it's absolutely not just about the internet. Anybody else? Well, Thank you very much, Rob, for your presentation, for answering the questions. Thank you for thank being you, with thank us. Thank you all for staying so late. Thank you.